everyone, this is update for July 15, 2023, day 407 of the war and of the date update. Also catch up for July 13 and 14. Um, as always, going to start with uh, strategic developments and then we're going to switch to the situation on the battlefield in Ukraine. So first, uh, as you can see from the map, um, I want to start with uh, Asia Pacific, obviously China. So uh, first, uh, there is a military exercise uh, together with uh, China and Russia in the uh, J uh, Sea of Japan here. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, both Russia and uh, China are actively learning how coordination between their uh, troops. Uh, and that's uh, this is, I think, not, not the first one. This is uh, one in many exercises. And again, the whole point is how to develop smooth cooperation between um, both, uh, um, uh, both militaries. Uh, Russia, uh, and then sort of related to this, uh, well, maybe actually let's just jump to, uh, to China. So effectively China got control of the Solomon Islands. So that's, this is here, a uh, little bit about months ago, or, um, maybe more, maybe two months ago, uh, US managed to kind of, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say take control of the, uh, Papua New Guinea but effectively be make it uh, a lie or at least neutral uh, neutral country so this was response from china and uh, to add to this is that and i don't know if that's true or not but uh, wall street journal is reporting that japan is not going to participate in conflict uh, over taiwan with uh, china that uh, that's the message from japan um so giving that and giving that china has taken over solomon islands um what this really means is um that um us probably will not be able to hold uh, in Ash in asia pacific um because without help of japan there's no way uh, to defend um Taiwan and now a uh, problem uh, for the US is that Guam is getting threatened which is somewhere in this area uh, so the whole area will be quickly will fall pretty quickly into Chinese hands basically if there is military conflict um, and then the obviously the next step with the Solomon Islands the, the control over those what this really means is the next step for China is going to be Australia uh, this is where um, the first sort of let's say if there is, if hopefully there is no this war, but if there is war, this war, uh, the the first step for China will be to take full control uh, over Asia Pacific, sort of similar to what uh, Japan strategy or I guess probably you can say lack of strategy was uh, in during World War II. Uh, they were trying to capture the entire uh, um, Asia Pacific the same is going to be happening in China with China and the problem for the US is as you can see uh, Pacific Ocean is huge and logistically it's going to be nearly impossible for the US uh, to defend successfully in uh, Asia Pacific given that uh, Chinese you know, military is not as weak as Japanese was relative to the US at that time Given that China has a huge, uh, uh, let's say, I wouldn't say advantage, but definitely not uh, inferior situation with the missiles, and that's really going to be make it extremely challenging to supply anything, and that's why Japan is so critical and it's so important uh, for um, basically defending uh, Asia Pacific. So again, this uh, looks. Uh, I would say pretty ugly um, uh, based on, on what's happening here. Uh, also, uh, sort of related to all of this, uh, there was a stealth mobilization in the US, over 3,000 troops called from reserve. They, they looks like they sent to Europe. Um, the reason I'm calling it stealth is because um, while everybody is knowing, you know, knows about it, uh, that this is happening, uh, most people kind of dismiss it as because just 
well, it's just 3,000, it's from reserve, those people are sort of anyways supposed to go um, sort of first and so on, but that's just the sort of first step, obviously, uh, and that's definitely not a good sign. Uh, that's really clear sign that uh, uh, current U.S. military is overstretched. Uh, and if there is something in Asia Pacific, it will mean the war on two fronts uh, for the U.S. Um, so uh, it, it's it's going to be extremely challenging, that's to say the least. Uh, also, Russia uh, doing similar things, not obviously doing well. They already did mobil sort of first round of mobilization, uh, but what they did also they passed the law that increases um, uh, age of people who are in reserve. Uh, so for the soldiers, it went from 50 to 55, for junior officers, from 55 to 60, and for senior officers, it's from 60 to 65. Um, as you can imagine, Russia does not need that for Ukraine. It has um, at least four times, and giving the, everything else that's going on in Ukraine is really probably like five times um uh, advantage over Ukraine. So you for, for, for Russia, even this war of attrition to win, they really don't need any of this. So this is again, this is uh, uh, <clears throat> there's more going on, you know, under the surface than um, that sort of, I would say, than we see basically, and especially giving this uh, uh, takeover of Solomon Islands, uh, you know, 3,000 people, uh, uh, troop, uh, troops, uh, with 3,000 people mobilized into the army in the U.S. Uh, and then Russia doing this uh, also effectively. So it's, I wouldn't call it stealth mobilization, but clearly a large war preparation uh, on the Russian side. It's definitely uh, not looking sort of great. Um, then also... Um, uh, few data points on uh, what's going on in Russia. Uh, Russian uh, oil, so about a, actually more than a year ago, there was expectation and also thought so that uh, Russian oil production will start declining, um, but it did not. Uh, and the reason for that is that oil's uh, uh, largest Western uh, oil service uh, companies uh, effectively never left Russia. So they were, because Russia heavily relies on uh, Western technology uh, in crude oil production. So the reason it was stable is because uh, they did not leave. And specifically, there are, so there are four of them, Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, and Weatherford. So uh, there were two remaining, uh, Schlumberger and Weatherford. So uh, Schlumberger just announced that they are leaving and only Weatherford left. So makes it uh, obviously more difficult for Russia to sustain crude oil production. And probably what this, where these companies were employed is in more sort of difficult, challenging environments because there's a lot of crude oil in Russia. And majority of it is... Um, where it's really easy to produce. So it's not going to be, you know, it doesn't mean that the production will collapse tremendously. No, it just, what this really means is that, uh, and what Russian government probably will do is they will just shut off this marginal, more challenging environments, fields with more challenging environments uh, that were supported by this uh, Western technology, which also kind of actually uh, makes sense for Russia because uh, they, anyways, were planning to reduce uh, crude oil production, you know, in this OPEC plus uh, to keep the uh, prices of oil high. So basically, they they decided to use sort of power of monopoly to squeeze uh, the same, you know, the same amount uh, of total value, total amount of money uh, from the world by just simply reducing uh, crude oil production. Uh, and as, as we all understand, the price of um, uh, crude will, will go up or will at least uh, remain stable. Um, uh, this is actually, there is sort of another sort of side uh, side of what's going on is the um, 
global cool down economic sort of recession and everything which obviously reduces uh, demand for crude oil so um, but at the same time Saudi Arabia actively reducing their own um, uh, production significant I think they announced like 1 million barrels per day uh, which is really big number and so we'll see what happens but uh, there's very good chance that we may see recession um, and the prices for crude will remain fairly elevated and sort of enough for Russia to survive uh, and keep going so it doesn't mean that okay that's what I'm trying to say that this um, uh, the, the departure of Schlumberger is not going to destroy Russian economy or anything like that. It's for sure not going to lead to that. Also, just to get a feeling of how strong Russian exports of crude oil are, is uh, currently Russia supplying 40% uh, of India's import of crude oil, basically leaving behind Saudi Arabia and you know Persian Gulf, other Persian Gulf countries. So basically, it's a dominant supplier of crude oil uh, to India. Um, so um, then let's actually switch a little bit to what's going on in. There's uh, one uh, metric of uh, what's going on in the Russian economy came out. So uh, construction uh, and the numbers are is that year on year for the first half of the year, uh, the amount, the number of uh, square meters uh, that was sort of built is up 0.9% year on year. Uh, just in June, it's up 9.1. So it sounds like uh, construction is a sector that's still holding strong in Russia. Uh, and even looks like uh, it's picking up a little bit. Uh, despite, if you remember, I was reporting that uh, the... Mm, uh, prices for real estate are definitely not going up or uh, and slightly declining like two three four percent but the construction sector is still holding on in Russia mm, you know and that's uh, uh, and it's huge employer by the way uh, obviously as you can imagine um, <clears throat> then um, uh, what else is uh, 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 Algiers president is going to visit uh, China. Chinese, Chinese, meet with Chinese president. Uh, why it's important is because Algiers is um, called like a stealth ally of uh, Russia, and you know very strong ally, strongly aligned with Russia. Uh, Russia is essentially has like a monopoly hold on the supply of weapons to Algiers, uh, and now it's sort of apparently it's going to be. Uh, building tie uh, with China and the and the situation and why Algiers is important because it's supplying uh, a lot of natural gas uh, to Europe. So if there is a hiccup there, it's definitely going to be extremely extremely uh, problematic um, uh, for um, uh, for Europe. Um, now let's actually switch to uh, situation uh, a little bit more related to Ukraine. And um, I was just listening uh, a little bit um, the, the speeches of the, some of the U.S. Um, presidential candidates, and specifically, specifically uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, and I think he was much more open uh, of, uh, of sort of the vision part of the Republican Party uh, how they, they, you know, how they see this conflict and actually kind of helps to understand uh, sort of, you know, their vision. Uh, and I'm not saying that he represents the entire Republican Party, but but it's definitely probably, I would say, third of the party, I think. Uh, and giving the, the number I'm, I'm taking is they were, they were voting uh, to think to to support Ukraine in terms of uh, uh, armaments, and there was about a third of Republican. I think like uh, ninety out of uh, two hundred. I think it's two hundred eighteen or two hundred twenty uh, were uh, voting uh, like against it. And so I guess it's probably more like forty percent. 
um, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, so the, the the view is that okay, we're gonna just uh, let Russia sort of keep what they captured in Ukraine, have some kind of peace. And then Russia will stop being a lie of China somehow. Uh, this this is absolutely, I would say, delusional thinking. That's I would say uh, at at best. Um, and the reason uh, this is completely delusional is because um, situation with Ukraine is in some way is binary. It's either the whole Ukraine or nothing for Russia. Russia does not want. Uh, what it captured, what what we see here, um, this is not what Russia wants. Russia wants the entire Ukraine, uh, and, and and they were very clear about that. Um, that's the first part. So they're not going to stop just because we wax things that uh, if he offers to Russia, uh, you know, piece of Ukraine uh, to appease, um, then Russia will. He just simply does not understand. Um, you know, uh, Russia, how Russian top things, how the Russian um, society thinks, and so on. Just uh, simply uh, too, how to say, too far away mentally to understand, really. Uh, and that's a big problem because he, I'm, he's not alone. I'm not picking up on him personally, um, but this is the part of the... Um, Republican Party that thinks that they can sort of put the head uh, in a, in the sand like an ostrich and everything's going to be fine. Um, the problem is is that uh, as I said, for Russia they they uh, want back all of the Ukraine and giving everything what's happening. This is there's no question. Uh, Ukraine, if let's say it loses these territories. Uh, it it will not be able to defend itself against Russia at that point. At this point, even at this point, basically, uh, for Ukraine, it's also all or nothing. Because you, otherwise, Ukraine will basically uh, become Belarus. And, uh, you know, as we all know, there is nuclear weapons in Belarus that aimed at basically uh, the West. I don't know where they aimed exactly, but I'm sure some of them are aimed at, at a major... Uh, European capitals and also probably US. Uh, so the same is going to be uh, with uh, Ukraine. So it's not going to happen some kind of like halfway uh, because, um, as I said, for Russia, they need the, the whole thing. Uh, the second part is uh, it's also delusional to think that Russia will stop being Chinese ally because they got this, you know deal uh, on uh, captured territories uh, the the bridges are burned at this point between West and Russia there is no turning back uh, and uh, just because of the inertia and everything how the population is sort of brainwashed in Russia uh, it just simply um, it literally the Russian political top will lose power if now they say, well, now it's going to have peace and uh, all of this was for nothing, just, uh, you know, get a little bit of territories. This, this, because uh, this is not uh, the way it's presented in Russia. It's not a war against Ukraine, first of all. This needs to be understood. And I think maybe it's poorly understood in the West. It's a uh, war against the West who is the way it's actually the, this is war against the west who is corrupted uh ukraine that used to be sort of uh i'd say uh part of russia and basically the the the, the evil is the west ukraine is just sort of victim of this evil things from the west that corrupted in it corrupted it corrupted ukraine uh, and now it becomes sort of tool of the west uh, against the Russia, so this needs this, and this is something that I think it's really poorly understood that this war is not against Ukraine per se. Ukraine is just um, between the rock and the hard place in some ways. Uh, it's sort of proxy war against the West. Just uh, Ukraine is just the most painful uh, place for Russia, so that's 
that's where it started let's put it this way um and the other part is is you know russia is is very uh, strongly at this point allied with with china and china is the same china understands that uh, at this point they need russian resources and russia is willing to say to sell it and they provide in return consumer goods and industrial goods in the way it's um natural perfect match in some way and it's very bad for the west but this works um uh, by the way there is there were actually numbers uh on the ex on the basic uh, trade between uh, the two countries so the trade between russia and china went up 40.6 percent in the first half of uh, 2023 relative to 2022 and it reached 114 billion us dollars uh versus for example uh you know let's say trade with the us between china and us it went down 14.5 percent uh and dropped to 327 billion so uh, trade with, with russia is because is, is getting towards uh, what third of trade with the us and uh us is be uh, basically while it's important uh market for consumer goods sort of for the end product uh at the same time russia is able to provide cheap resources uh for china and uh that allows china to export elsewhere and to you know basically uh gain more market share worldwide because they can reduce the cost of the exports and so on and in case of the war um they they have supply of resources they have supply of crude they have supply of food <coughs> uh, so again this alliance um is is set in motion and it's not gonna change let's say even um you know republican party says okay take the whole of ukraine the alliance will not uh, will not fall apart uh, because the reason for that is because um, Russia and China, they want uh, to change the world, right? The power distribution in the world, what is called multipolar world. And so they, that's, so in other words, the, the, the war is not about the territories lit per se. It's, it's about who's going to be controlling the world, the future of the world. So it's more like worldview philosophical. It's always about ideas right it's not about just territories and i think that's what um what is lacking in understanding um uh about this whole situation and if ukraine falls into completely into the russian hands uh what is going to happen is um russia will be tremendously stronger it's um uh, mm, if, if i use this uh, movie analogy uh, it's like a fifth element that's missing for Russia to become dominant. And so uh, that's why Russia is uh, fighting for Ukraine. So in, it needs uh, entire uh, peace, not just piece of the peace. So again, I uh, just want to explain how uh, misguided uh, those, that thinking is. And thinking that uh, you, know, you can remove Russia from China is even more misguided. Uh, just as I said, uh, Russian president is uh, set to go to uh, to visit Chinese president in October, and as we all know, the situation economic in China economic situation is getting worse uh, by day. They pumping money that not money but credit into the economy to try to to uh, to spur the growth, and it simply doesn't work because it's over levered. So eventually, this may force the hand of the Chinese president uh, to basically initiate a military conflict, because that's a solution for the huge army of um, people or population in China that has no vision, no future, no no clear where where they going, and 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 because otherwise they can they can create problem to social with social unrest inside of the China and um, you know, social uh, rest or is extremely sensitive thing um, 
in China, especially this uh, topic of social control, it's it's literally obsession in China. And so, uh, if there is a threat of um, this to social unrest, the solution is going to be military conflict. And and I would say this is as the trade between the U.S. and China goes down, the chances of it is also going up. Uh, you know, it's inversely related because there is no trade, then why not have a war? Um, that's just unfortunate uh, reality uh, of life. Um, now let's uh, switch to actual battlefield in Ukraine. So I mentioned that um, the the head of the Russian 58th Army was dismissed because he was complaining. Uh, now the the general that's in in charge of 106 Airborne Division uh, was also dismissed. Um, because he also was complaining about things that are not done right. So what this really means is um, the Russian Minister of Defense and his uh, and head of his he uh, uh, headquarters, uh, they effectively removing any opposition, any any dissent uh, from Russian uh, military forces and and sort of cleansing. So first, obviously, was uh, was Wagner Group, uh, even though it wasn't part of the Russian military, but uh, it, it was part, um, you know, it was rival to Russian military. So first they sort of get rid of that external enemy, and then now they cleaning inside uh, of the system to have absolutely loyal, um, you know, uh, generals. Uh, this is absolutely positive for Ukraine because. Uh, they removing more capable generals and making Russian army more, even more Soviet army. So, on, on, in some in some way, it helps Ukraine. Uh, it's definitely not going to help to win the war for Ukraine. Ukraine is is uh, have the same problems uh, where, as I said before, uh, the people who are most capable they actually also pushed out. Uh, they kept at the, you know, at the, you know, battalion level at ma at most. Uh, they don't, they don't, they don't raise. So there is no meritocracy basically, right, in 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 Ukraine and in um, in Russia. And that's a definition of the Soviet army, right, where um, you know the top is seeking out um, incompetent but absolutely loyal. Uh, people to surround and, and that's how it's being sort of ruled in a way um, and as I said the, the positive is uh, for Ukraine that you know Russian army is becoming even more incompetent um, so it's it's kind of like a, in a way race to the bottom uh, from both sides um, and, and actually just want to say uh, about you know what I was talking about this WAC and part of the Respo Republican Party. Uh, that uh, I want to. There's part of where it's uh, in a way mixed, where mm, you know Ukrainian top, especially political top. Uh, you know they absolutely corrupt, but that's not the reason. Um, to think that the uh, Ukrainian population is sort of wrong and doesn't deserve uh, a choice for self-determination. Because self um, those, in a way, it's two parallel worlds, as I described before, and, and they will have sort of uh, uh, separate passes in the future um, relative to each other. So that's why I think uh, there is assumption that uh, you know when they see this uh, corrupt political talk from Ukraine that therefore <clears throat> the whole thing needs to be sort of thrown sort of as what they say I think it's called uh, throwing ba uh, uh, baby with the bathwater right so that's where uh, there is a problem here in in that thinking as well um, now let's do a quick walk through the front line so the situation alone in a clockwise fashion as I always do starting from very north so the situation along the state border is more or less stable definitely not increasing in intensity probably decreasing somewhat uh, essentially 
no changes there. Um, now let's jump to the North Luhansk front line. Things here are more or less the same. There are some minor advances by Russian troops here where they're attacking. I don't know, it's call it 200 meters, 300 meters. Again, tactical advances, tactical attacks. It, it's nothing major, sort of your typical World War I type of situation. Uh, otherwise, nothing major is happening here. Now let's quickly jump to uh, North Donbass front line. Things here are somewhat similar in, in uh, as up in the north in, and a huge difference from what it used to be when the Wagner group was operating here. Now it's becoming, um, you know, sleepy quarter of the front line, let's put it this way. Uh, the only area where there is still some action is here near Klishivka. It's all still all very tactical and the only reason something is happening here is because of this 3rd Brigade, which is, uh, I would say, pieces of Azov, I guess, or remnants of Azov. Uh, brigade and there is a much higher motivation there and so they are um, you know they obviously attacking and, and have some limited success relative to the Russian um, Russian troops actually to extent uh, it actually created quite a bit of stress on the Russian side like local stress where uh, they actually had to throw special forces um, detachments which if you've seen probably i shown uh the um, where is it uh russian troops they generally have this uh, special forces brigade they're small in size uh like for example 14 here they used to be they they used to use uh, in the initial phase quite a bit of those um <clears throat> and they usually could be as low as uh you know 500 uh uh, people to 1300 somewhere in that ballpark they they fairly small um, but they are much better motivated and, and so on so again things become uh, very difficult here because your typical soviet troops they don't stand against motivated troops uh, and so they had to throw in because they don't have wagner uh, mercenaries uh, they at first they threw this airborne troops which are a little bit better uh, didn't help then they threw this uh, special forces units to basically stem the tide so far it's holding on um, you know there might be more sort of uh, tactical success uh, by the Azov uh, in the coming weeks maybe they will uh, liberate this Klishivka but again this is all absolutely tactical doesn't really change anything uh, from a big picture perspective uh, but just so kind of like again this so basically the same thing is happening is, you know, Soviets versus Soviet army, they basically equal, they just stand and are, you know, no movement essentially either side. If you have a little bit more motivated unit, uh, then it's always going to uh, win over Soviet army. Um, now let's uh, move towards uh, central Donbass front line. Things here are, as always, the same uh, locations, Marinka. Uh, the Spitsky salient in this area, we call it Abdivka salient, but again, no changes, no advances, just uh, just World War One type of grind. Uh, now let's move to the Parisia front line. Uh, things here are fairly quiet. The only place where uh, Ukrainian side is still trying to achieve something, at least tactically squeeze Russian troops, is this. Uh, this area, Staromlinivka, Rojaina, um, there are, uh, Ukrainian side is continuing uh, tactical attacks. They're not major offensive at this point, and um, they're still trying to squeeze, and it's done in the most uh, inefficient and ineffective way by squeezing Russian troops, uh, which um, uh, consumes a lot of resources, and, and there is no gain, and there is no light at the end of the tunnel there so it's essentially based of precious resources ukraine has unfortunately um, i don't know what else to add to this uh, otherwise things are fairly uh, quiet uh, and then uh, situation remains the same stable without changes here along the dnipro river uh, ukrainian uh, side uh, keeps uh, this uh, small bridgeheads 
There is no uh, attempts to expand those. Uh, there is also uh, no attempts to destroy those bridgeheads by the Russian side. So it's basically in balance right now. How long it's going to remain there uh, remains to be seen. Um, but for now, it's as a summary, this is one big sort of um, World War One, uh, World War One uh, mid grind with no movement by other side, and, and strategically they are sort of not able to advance and totally turning into the war of attrition, which is uh, Russian side is pretty happy about because. As I said before, there is at least four time advantage, and I would say at this point it's five time advantage uh, relative to the loss of population and everything uh, that Ukraine had. So, from a Russian sort of political top perspective, they content with this, and they just want to keep it going for as long as until basically uh, Ukraine collapses out due to the natural exhaustion of resources and as I, human resources, obviously. Uh, which is not far away, as I said before. The the new uh, people who come uh, into the units, they definitely have uh, very low motivation. Uh, this is definitely not the same uh, what it used to be. Let's say a year ago, um, um, you know, Ukraine lost uh, the the cream of the crop at this point for the most part. Not all of it, obviously, but. There is still some backbone left, but it's definitely um, the quality of the troops uh, uh, declined uh, for sure. And the training that's happening in the West is complete is not compensating at all. Uh, in many ways, it's a waste of resources for, for, for the West, the way the training of what they, they, they basically being taught, it's largely irrelevant uh, and that's another big problem uh, that it just uh, sort of in a way like okay check mark we did the training uh, whether the training is relevant or not uh, nobody's trying to even figure out um, so that's all for today thanks for watching till next time bye bye